good at all times. You know, like Cedric, Meshach, Abednego, standing before the fiery furnace. The king was telling him, you know, if you don't bow down to the statue that I've laid here, I'm going to throw you into the fire. And you know what these guys, they have the audacity to tell him, king, let it be known unto you. They're challenging the king. You know, let it be known unto you. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter how much you threaten us, let this be known unto you. We will not bow down to your demands. Amen. You know, this is the quality of a son of God. We don't bow down to the demands of our earthly nature. We make the heavenly nature our priority and we make the earthly, earthly nature succumb, respect, honor to the power that has been bestowed upon us. Amen. You are the sons of God. And I want you to know this, understand this, and live with this thought. Whether we like it or not, you are sons of God. Amen. <laughs> Can we continue talking about the sons of God? You know, we've been talking about it. And every, every month, I mean, every week, it's exciting for me personally. So it's like this, you know. I know to make biryani, I'll give, make biryani. Uh, if... You go to a Mangalorean, you get Mangalore food, right? You get, go to a, a Tamil, you know, Chetinadu, that side, Madurai, you get nice food like the Amma Mess and the Ariba, and Coimbatore, you get Ariba one because they are famous for it. So this year, I, I am more on the sons of God. So you will get more on being the sons of God, right? So let's read uh, Romans 8. Uh, 19, 20, and 21. I'm sure by the end of this year, you all will know this verse by heart. <laughs> Can we read it? The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. I mean, we see two things here. Bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of children of God. Bondage to decay and glorious freedom of the children of God. You know, the, the thing is, the creation is subjected to decay. But what it is longing for is it wants to get into the glorious freedom of God's children. You know, when you talk about this decay that it is subjected to, you know, if you look at it, decay is absence of life. Right? Gangrene. Decay. It means absence of life. Where there is no life, it decays. Right? You get it? Where there is no life, there is decay. So, when there is life, decay is done away with. But where there is no life, everything starts to decay. It's like this gangrene. You know why gangrene happens? Because the blood is not able to flow. So, life can flow into that place where it is wounded and heals a wound. So when there is no flow of blood, you know, there is no flow of life. Because there is no flow of life, the cells die there. The cells are not able to function and supply life and healing to the wound. That's why gangrene happens. And eventually you'll have to cut it off. Or there, are, there are times where, you know, it becomes so septic that even people die. It just takes life out. So decay is absence of life. And the thing is, here we see that the creation is subjected to decay. That means bondage to decay. That means there is no life there. No, where did this happen? Where did life stop flowing? I mean, we read it. Genesis chapter 1, 2. You know, God told Adam and Eve, there are many trees in this garden, including the tree of life and the tree of good and evil. And God told Adam, please guy, don't eat from the tree of good and evil but you can tree it from any tree that is there in the garden including the tree of life but what did Adam do instead of eating from the tree of life which would have instilled life of God in him 
you know, which could have, you know, protected him from decay, which could have kept him away from death, he went and had from the tree of good and evil. In another word, he closed himself. He kept himself away from life and chose to eat from the tree of good and evil. And immediately after that we see, you know, he's running to cover his shame, his fear, his pain, his anguish. So what happened there? Instead of eating life, he ate good and evil. Instead of eating which could have produced life inside of him, he chose what he can do to have life. You know, good and evil. Good and evil is about what you and I can do. So that's why he's immediately running to cover his shame. He's immediately running to, you know, in his own efforts. But whereas God said, life through what I tell you, you know, through that fruit, he could have had it. But that's when DK came into the system. But the thing is, uh, God is always a God of second chances. Believe that. He's always a God of many a chances. You can mess I will be bold enough to say this. You can miss how many ever times you want. Okay? You can miss how many ever times you want. You can, you know, lose it how many ever times you want. But God is able to bring you back to life. Amen? God is able to establish life in you. God is able to bring you into life. I mean, read Romans chapter 5, verse 17. It says like this, For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man. How did death come into existence? Through that one man. Through that one man, death reigned. How much more, more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life. You know, it says, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? See, God's heart for you is to reign, amen, not to run. Is to be in control, not to be controlled. Is to be in power and authority, not to be powered by. And here he's saying, how much more those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life. You see? What is given back again? What that one man lost? This man gave back. Who is that one man? Adam. And who is this one man who gave it back? Jesus. What did he lose? He lost life. And what did he give? He came to give life again. And here we see that this one man, you know, how does he establish life here? Not through anything he can do. Not through anything you and I can accomplish. It says through the abundant provision of grace. Do you see that? Saying, you know, it is through my provision of grace. You know, what is grace all about? Grace is what God can do for you without you paying a price. You know, that's what exactly Adam did, right? As soon as he messed up, what was he trying to do? He's trying to cover. He's going, you know, getting all the fig leaves and then he's saying, I'm going to cover myself. His own efforts, his own works. But do you think that is enough? Those fig leaves, after two days it would have given him a rash. It would have exposed him. And he should be running again. And God said, you know, enough of your nonsense. Let me give you an alternative. A sacrifice that will cover you. That can take care of you. That can provide for you. That can keep you away from shame. That can keep you away from nakedness. You know, I will make a way for you. And then he offered a sacrifice and clothed them. That is grace. His provision for you. His provision for all your needs. His provision for all the worthiness that you deserve. His provision for all the position that you should be positioned in. He's saying, I will provide. 
through the abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. In another word, he is positioning you in life through that one man, Jesus Christ. Through that one man, he was subjected to decay and now through this one man, you are positioned in life. Amen. So where are you now? Not in decay, but in life. Not in death, but in life. How? Through that one man, Jesus Christ. Who's life for you? That one man, Jesus. What this one man lost, this one man gained for you. You know, that's why when Jesus came into this world, he said, I am the, I am the bread of life. Didn't he say that? John chapter 6, turn with me to John chapter 6, 35. When Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. He said, I am the bread of life. You know, it's like this. How many of you know what a food can do for you? Okay, let me tell you this. Ask this question. When you have gastric, you know, when there's chest burn, how many of you had jeera? Right? We take jeera, we take vendayam. You know why? Because we believe it helps in assuaging that effect of the chest burn or the reflex and everything. And when you eat it, what do you do? You expect the jeera to work its magic in you, right? Isn't that so? And then you chew. And when you're chewing, it's not like, you know, I don't think it is going to help. Do you chew like that? You chew with this hope that this jeera, it's somehow it's going to produce those enzymes that's going to take away the effect of the acid reflex. So now, Jesus is saying, you know what guys? That one man instilled death in this world and through me, life is going to be reinstilled again. Because that's what he said. I am the way, the truth and the life. John 10.10, 10, what did he say? I came to give life and life in abundance. He's saying, I am the life. I came to give life. I became flesh to give life. And Jesus is a life for you. And now he is saying, I am the bread of life. In another word, if you believe in me, what you are saying is, I, when you eat of me, I am here to instill Life in you. Do you get it? I, Jesus came to instill life in you. He didn't come to take demand from you. He came to supply. But we've made Jesus a demanding God. No? And we say things like, you know, you whipped. We say things like, you know, he scolded the people. But who did he? Who was he angry with? He was not angry with the sinners. He was not angry with the right, bad people. He was not angry with the women at the, on, at the well. He was not angry with the women who was caught and prostitute. You know who he was angry with? With people who were so religious. With people who were so ritualistic. They, I mean, they look at him. He is life. And then they are saying, you know what? Why are you asking them not to do all these things? He was angry with, you know, uh, with people who were selling, who were doing business in the church. Why was he angry? You know, because he was stopping people from entering the court, from coming into the temple. He was angry with them. But we take all of that. You know, once uh, I called this guy to do calendars for our church. And two young chaps, uh, just out of their college, and then they started this business. I said, you know, we want to design some calendars for the church. So they came. And I said, you know what? This is this, this, this. And uh, we need to uh, fix a rate. And he said, they had this turn was, Pastor, we don't like doing business with the church. I said, why? Jesus whipped everyone who did business in the church. I said, you know, in Tamil you can say easily, Ada Pavingla. Jesus <laughs> said, 
we get so confused and make everything so ritualistic. He was angry with them. He was angry with the accusing people. I will even say, you know, Jesus sitting on the throne and he's angry with the pastors who are condemning the people who are listening to them. Not with me. I don't condemn you. <laughs> I will never condemn. I don't live in condemnation. You don't live in condemnation. We are not in condemnation because we are in Jesus. And God wants you to be in control. Amen. See, when you realize that life is in you, you will learn to take control of your circumstances. Do you get it? When you realize you are in Jesus, you will learn to take control of your circumstances. It's like this. You know, Jesus, he was one day traveling in the boat along with his 12 disciples. And as he was going in the boat, suddenly there's a storm that was raging. And who was there in the boat? Life is in the boat. And who are these 12, 12 disciples? They were with life. But you know what they were trying to do? They were trying to save themselves. What are they doing? You know, six this side and six that side. Come on, let's row the boat. Let's keep it safe. And whereas Jesus, he is full of life and he's sleeping. You know why he was sleeping? He knew the circumstances cannot kill him. Amen. What people are saying cannot kill him. The storm cannot kill him. The thunder cannot kill him. The needs cannot kill him. The sickness cannot kill him. Because he knew the life in him is greater than the power of the decay that is functioning in this world. You know, I told you fig leaves, right? These guys were exactly doing the fig leaves. Trying to row themselves out of the trouble. Trying to bring themselves out of the trouble. Ele lo you know? Elelo Ailesa. I'm sure they wouldn't have sung Elelo Ailesa. That is only in the movies when everything is serene, beautiful, you know. Then suddenly Elelo Ailesa. Then the hero goes there. Then the heroine is at the shore. He's saying Elelo Ailesa. When it's Tom, no Elelo Ailesa. But life was sleeping there. He knew he's full of life. He is sleeping, not troubled by the circumstances, not troubled by the storm. And when he rose up, you know what? He spoke life. And then he said, storm, you cannot kill me. Be quiet. Don't do your drama here. Don't show your tantrums here. I want to know this. You can speak into your circumstances and calm them. You can speak life into lifelessness around you. You can speak life into all the dead dreams and the dead desires and the dead longing you have. You can bring them back to life if you believe that you are in Jesus. You know, like I said, we all need to understand that you are in Christ Jesus. Don't believe you know, God will leave you and go away. Can I tell you a true story that happened in South Africa? There was this big pastor. He was a pastor of a big church. It's a true story. I'm not lying. He's a pastor of a big church. And something happened. You know, thank God in our church there is no committee. Even when it grows big, I won't have committee. <laughs> We all will work together. We all will function together. We all will do together. Amen. When it grows big. We'll have 10 pastors, 20 pastors standing and rallying behind this one pastor. That's how we will work. They had this big committee and somehow they put some false allegations against him and then they chucked him out of the church. He was so broken. He was so down. He started, you know, drinking and he said, I'm done with this church. I'm done with this God. I'm done with all these things. He started drinking. One fine day, he was sitting in a pub and drinking. And there walked this lady. She saw him and then told him, aren't you the pastor from that church? He said, I was, but I'm no more. And the, little, and the lady in a drunken stupor said, my, my, my daughter is possessed. I want you to come and pray for my daughter. And this poor guy, he's, he's so drunk. You know, he's saying, no lady, I can't do that. But the lady was so insistent. He, she said, I want you to come today. And you know, I want you to pray for my daughter. She dragged him home. 
And he couldn't do anything. He was so drunk. He went there. And for her sake, he said, in the name of Jesus. And I'm sure he would be dancing. In the name of Jesus, get out. Apparently, the demon spoke out of her and told him, you might have left Jesus, but Jesus didn't leave you. And she was delivered that day. You know, what I want you to understand is this. You are in life, you are in Jesus. So if any one of you is doubting your salvation, stop doubting your salvation. Amen. You are saved for good. You, you, you can never be saved more than this. You can never get holier than this. You can never get righteous than what you are today. My son can never do anything more to be my son. He is son. In the same way is your salvation. So I want you to understand you are in Christ Jesus. You know there is this beautiful scripture in 1 John 5.12. It says if anyone has a son, he has life in him. Can we read that? 1 John chapter 5 verse 12. He who has a son has life. See, I want, the thing I want you to understand this, the tree of life, Adam rejected. Today, I'm presenting to you the tree of life again. He is Jesus Christ. It's saying, if any, he who has a son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So today, I want you to understand, you have Jesus in you. Amen? You have Jesus in you and you have life in you. So you can also rise up like Jesus did. You can speak. You can declare. You can pronounce. You can decree. And you will see things happening because what is in you is life. Ability to produce life. You know, that's why God knew all of this. And then he wrote through Solomon, life and death are in the power of your tongue. Life and death are in the power of your tongue. He said, you know what? As you can, you can speak, you can bring out what is there inside of you. Before that, you need to recognize what is there inside of you and you need to speak it out. It is in the power of your tongue. You can produce life by the power of your tongue. You can produce life by what you speak. You can produce life by what you say. What do we speak? Ayo, brother, I am Why do you want to know? My love, my life sucks, brother. It's so, it's so boring. I don't love my life. They're so negative. They are oozing with negativity. I mean, you should give them one clap. Tell them at least say something good, no? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. When you recognize what you have in you, you will speak right. You will say things right. You will declare things right. Just like Jesus did. He didn't try and you know, work as drama. He didn't do anything extraordinary. He just got up from the boat and then he said, you know what? Be still storm. We read in the Bible, there was a calmness. The raging storm just kept quiet. Why? Because he knew he had life in him. I want you to know you have life inside of you. Amen. Jesus came to instill life in you. Jesus came to cancel death out of your system, decay out of your system, lifelessness out of your system, decrease out of your system, you know, poverty out of your system, weakness out of your system. He came to instill life in abundance in you. If uh, he who has the son has life, do you believe you have Jesus in you? Do you feel it? Even if you don't feel it, believe it. You know, Joyce Mayer used to say this. Emotions are a believer's biggest enemy. We like to feel. Why you don't say, I love you today? Wives ask their husbands, no? Why you didn't say, I love you today? They like to feel. They get very upset. 
Why, why didn't you say? Why didn't you do this? But we like to feel. You know, that's where the enemy plays the game. When, you, when you're looking for feeling, I need to feel God's presence. I need to feel the tingling. Sense. Come on, stop it. Believe you have life in you. Walk with this attitude. Wherever I go, I am the carrier of life. Whatever I do, I am the doer of life there. Whatever I say, it will bring life into that place. Amen? So he who has a son has life. Can I show you another verse? John chapter 6 from 51, we will read. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh. I will give for the life of the world. You know, listen to this. He's saying, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And this is the most important part. It says, this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. What is he saying? This flesh is given for the life of the world. In another word, it's saying, this world is subjected to decay, but my flesh is given to cancel decay. Isn't what it is? He's saying, this, 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 my flesh is given for the life of the world. So when Jesus came down, you know, he's saying, I came to cancel death. We read in 2 Timothy 1.10, he canceled death and brought life and immortality into light. You see that? He canceled death totally by his death and then he's brought life and immortality into light. So you and I, now because of the sacrifice of Jesus, are living under the influence of life and immortality. That means you will not die. You will not die. That means everything about you will not die. That means the power in you is such that it will bring an immortality into everything around you. You have the ability to supply life. But for that he is saying, you know, if anyone eats of this bread, I'm going to talk about communion. First week, no? Let's talk about communion. Okay. If anyone eats of this bread, and we, let's go to 53. It's saying, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood, you have no life in you. Why? Unless you eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. So now, remember this. He's saying, you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have life in you. That's what he's saying. Can you imagine how many are kept away from communion? That means they are kept away from life. I believe we all should participate in the communion every day. You don't need a church. You don't need to come to a building. This is a building. You don't need a pastor. It is a relationship between the son who came down to make me his son. It is the key to activate the sonship. It is the key to activate life in you. So if that is the case, why should I stop myself from having communion? Why should I need a pastor? Why should I need someone to tell me, you know, this is his flesh and this is his blood and drink of it? No, you can take it. You can participate. And every day when you participate in the communion, you know what you're doing? You are activating the life of God in you. And the next thing Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Do you see that? Who has son has life. Didn't we read that? He's saying, you know, this is how I remain in you and you remain in me by participating in the communion. By eating of my flesh and drinking of my blood. You want to remain in Jesus? Take part in the communion.
We know the arranged marriage system here in India, right? You know, when is a seal, the deal is sealed? Do you know? It's not because a girl likes a girl, the girl likes a boy or the boy likes a girl. You can like, you don't, you cannot like, but not then. You know, you don't know that. You need to go and eat in their house. Either in the girl's house, then the girl's house will come to the boy's house, they will eat. And when they eat, the seal, the deal is sealed. That's it. Whether the boy likes a girl or the girl likes a boy, they like it, they don't like it. The parents have agreed, the deal is sealed. See, the system is like this. And now, here God is telling you the same thing. You know what? You eat of my flesh and you drink of my blood. I am in you and you in me. You get it? <laughs> but we are talking holy things. Did you, part, did you pray? Did you sanctify yourself? Did you watch TV? Did you watch serial? And in Tamil, they say it beautifully. Puttu poo vaykar avargalikku inge thiruvirundu kodukku pada matadu avargal ellarum daiva saithu veliyelindu poguvum Everyone step outside. And poor thing, it's a walk of shame for all these people. That's so, so, I mean, I've sat under those teachings. It's so, so shameful. And they will be putting their head down and walking out. They cannot even sit inside the church. But here he is saying, you, wanna, you want me to be in you? I want to be with you. And you want me to be in you? Come, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. I will be in you. And you will be in me. That means life in you. What Adam lost is given back. He chose not to eat. And today people are telling the church not to eat. He chose to eat good and evil. Today the, te the church is teaching good and evil. What can you do to please God? What should you do to please God? Stop that. Don't believe that. If anyone comes to you telling you, you know, you should do this for God to do this, shut up. Tell them, get out. They need to be chucked out first. You need to tell them, stop your nonsense. I know how loving my father is. He gave his only son. He said, there is life in you. He said, there is life in you. He came to give life here. He came to fill you with life. He came to instill life in you. So you'll be freed from the bondage of decay. So that means you have no chance to lose in life anymore. Amen. You have no chance to lose in life anymore. You are led by the spirit of God. Because the Bible says those who are led by the spirit are called the sons of God. Oh, I forgot to show you another verse. Thank God I talked about spirit. Okay, listen to this. Same, John 6, 63. The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. Right? The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. What is flesh? Okay, let's be typical. And say, what is flesh? Flesh means sin, right? That's what we know. <laughs> the works of the flesh. Can I tell you? Flesh, it's not talking about sin. It is talking about the likeness. See, our God is spirit. Have you read that? He's a spirit being. And now we have the spirit of God. And that's why we are called the sons of God. But when we were in the likeness of the flesh, in another word, when we were in the likeness of Adam, subjected to decay, he's saying it is nothing. But I am making you something through my spirit in you, spirit of sonship in you. And the next word he's saying, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. He's saying the words I speak to you are life. See, that's why... You know, you speak word, you speak life through your, through your words. But we are so scared to speak. Because we give heed to the flesh. 
we speak heat to our mind we speak heat to our you know the emotions we speak we give heat to the reality our feelings our emotions but god is saying speak life man go on and speak life if the doctor comes and tells you you are going to die in 24 hours you tell them i will live after 24 hours even if i die i will die according to your word and because i speak this after i die i will rise again i will come back again and i live you can speak it you know when i'm talking about death don't take only physical death it could be a death in your job in your relationship in your finances in your happenings around you can speak life don't listen to them you know what there are two kinds of knowledge right one is the head knowledge one is the revelation knowledge revelation knowledge is based on the spirit head knowledge is based on your natural being so the revelation knowledge you know it acts like this it is based on what the spirit wants you to say so what do you think the spirit would want you to say at all times will it speak death it will speak only life so don't you know be around people who are saying it cannot happen to you because god said all things are possible for those who believe that is what you need to keep speaking Okay, let's come back to communion because I wanted to talk about you know the talking the right word. Let's come back to communion. You know what? When we are participating in the communion, you are recognizing the life of God in you. You are recognizing the power of God's life in you. So don't keep yourself away. As family, participate every day. even if if your husband doesn't want to participate don't worry you do it if your wife doesn't want to participate you do it you know uh, my uh, my dad it, uh, shared with me this testimony we spoke about this communion to one pastor so in his personal prayer he's taking communion 5 o'clock in the morning after that his wife they both get together 7 o'clock before breakfast they having communion again because they have understood the significance of it when i participate in the communion i'm eating life i'm drinking life in my system amen so you want to see life happen participate in the communion you know you want to know what to do right do this <laughs> do this you know the bible talks about uh paul is writing if anyone participates in an unworthy manner and it says you know he has to examine what is his unworthy manner what is this that you need to examine let me explain you can go home and read it says in an unworthy manner and to examine if you look at it in between there is a scripture he needs to examine whether he recognizes the body of jesus christ what you should examine he should examine his heart whether he is recognizing what the body of jesus christ has done and if he doesn't examine his heart to recognize what the body of jesus christ has done that is being unworthy if you are sitting there wondering what i have done right to participate in the communion you are worse no hope for you you know that's why people die in sickness <laughs> the bible says no he is writing that's why people are weak that's why people are dying in sickness because they are not allowing the life of god to flow into the weakness and sicknesses they are placing the fig leaves their own efforts but whereas you know when you recognize yes the body of jesus christ that was sacrificed on the cross of calvary he was sacrificed to give life to me then what happens you are opening the flood gates of life to flow into every weaknesses every sicknesses everything that is lacking in me you are just opening the flood gates today i want you to know you are filled with life again amen you are no more subjected to decay you are not no more subjected to death you are filled with life and immortality don't be afraid you know of this word i'm saying immortality because many a people are confused and they're saying it is a wrong doctrine it is not a doctrine that is the right of sons of god that means i choose when to die do you get it i choose death when i want to die 
if I believe I'm going to live till 80, I will believe. I will live. Because Jesus, when he died, the Bible says he didn't die because, you know, life left him. He gave up the ghost. When Paul was living in the world, he said, for me to die is gain. To live is Christ. But because it will be good for me to be here, I choose to live. In another word, he's calling death, come here death. He's calling life, come here. And then he's thinking, should I go? These guys are troubling me. Or should I be here for the beneficial of the church? And then he said, if I'm here, I will give more revelation, more inputs into this gospel of grace, into this new covenant reality, into this new creation. He said, death, go away. I will die when I want to die. That is how... You and I are sons of God. So don't get confused. Because some people say, you will not die. I'm not saying you will not die. You will die when you want to. If sickness comes to you, you stand and write, you stare right in the face of sickness and say, you know what? That is the report from the flesh. From the world system. From according to the world. But let me talk to you from the heavenly system. There is life in me which is able to cancel the effect of death through the world report. And then I cancel it in Jesus name. And that's it. This is how you function in life. Amen. Today we are participating in the communion again. You know as we are participating. I want you to believe this. That life is activated in you. And what you speak is going to happen because it has the ability to bring life into everything that is dead and gone. It's going to cancel death. It's going to cancel lack. It is going to cancel weakness. It is going to cancel the poverty. You know, by the end of this march, your life is going to have a turnaround. You know, in Tamil it says beautifully, Kariyam Marudalai Mudindadu. Things became contrary. In the KJV it says. In the NIV, things changed. I speak a change into your system. I speak change. How? Through the life that is teeming inside of you. That is flowing inside of you. Can we stand to our feet? A gracious heavenly father. I want to thank you for this beautiful day. This beautiful month. As your people go into this month, just like I prophesied, things will be contrary. There will be a change. This month will be a month of turnaround. This month will be a month of healing, increase, abundance and prosperity that can come through the life that is instilled in this world through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. They will lack nothing, Lord. At all times. They will have everything at all times. For all things. Let the angels go with each and every one. Let your peace which pass with all understanding. Guard every heart and mind. Let your blood cover them. Protect them. And provide for them. Let there be testimonies of good days and good things Lord. Let the supernatural be the happening of their daily life. In Jesus' name, amen.